I think that how we manage, how women manage these complicated ways of understanding and appreciating each other, particularly during a time when our nation is grappling with immigration mm -hmm. and a whole host of issues around who is American, is, is just, it, it's, a, it's an incredibly profound time. Talk a little bit about how we stand in allyship, how we work through to understand and appreciate each other. So I think, first of all, women rock. Um, if you want to know, yeah, absolutely. If you want to know how to get there, wherever it is you're trying to go, follow women, because we, for the most part, know how to draw the map and drive the car. That's right. Um, and, you know, I think the Women's March on Washington is an example of how women came together and our allies. There were many men who were involved, many folks who are gender nonconforming, who were involved with helping us to make it happen. But we dealt with so many people calling us saying, men particularly, there's no way that all of you women can put this together. There's no way. January 21st won't happen without us. And we were thinking, so you think we can't plan a march, but we actually have babies. Like, really? <laughs> <laughs> we can actually do this. And to see that January 21st came together was so incredible for, for me and for so many. We had uh, hundreds of people who worked to make it happen, mm -hmm. women who left their jobs, left their families, left everything in order to make that incredible day of five million people coming together happen. So I believe that women will certainly be a part of the leadership out of this dark moment that we're in. Um, you know, we see that women are beginning to run for office all over the country yeah. in ways that we never saw before. And that, absolutely. So I think we have the answer. I mean, if you look at just what black women have done, 94% of black women voted for Hillary Clinton. Whether or not we liked her, we, it wasn't personal, it wasn't about what she was wearing or you know, any of that. We voted with our conscience and we voted on behalf of our children and our children's children. So to be more specific, if you wanna know really how to get there, follow women of color on your way to where you're going. That's why I follow you on Instagram. <laughs> well, hopefully there'll be something good there, but you know, just ignore my ratchet days on Instagram because okay. I still post That's Cardi B and others like that. Right. Okay. <laughs> but you know, so I do I do think that women have a special compassion. And if you look at how the Women's March came together, when I talk about that whole idea of putting down your issue and being concerned with the issues of other communities, that's how that five million number came that's together. Right. It wasn't that we all agreed. It wasn't that we were all going to continue to work together. People didn't even like one another. Trust me, the Women's March was a labor of love and pain mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, but what we decided was that we're all in this boat together. We're feeling this despair we know that our communities are going to catch hell. And in order for us to really show America what it looks like to be concerned and be my sister's keeper, we're going to have to come and show up in ways that we've never shown up before. And so hopefully now we will continue to show up for one another. And hopefully our men won't feel that they are right. not included in this, but actually will run to it and say, you know, if we wherever women are gathering, I want to be there because they are true leaders. That's right. And you know, I was one of those five million. And the, the thing that struck me about that day, I mean, there were so many images that struck me about that day, but the number of men yeah. who were there, the number of people from across socioeconomic class, across race, ethnicity, religious backgrounds, I mean, it was really profound. And you know, one of the reasons we wanted to put this in the middle, mm. Wonder Women in the middle of the day, is we want to be able to say to the guys, you know, how do you fit here? How do you, how do you step up into spaces that perhaps you want to step into around whatever form of activism it is that you, you see fit? Yeah, I mean, I think with men still holding the keys to power in a lot of positions, you know, in, in this country, we know that men are still sort of holding on and women are breaking ceilings and busting glasses and all of that, but we're not there yet. Um, we believe that men need to be coming to the table saying, you know, we are equals. 
we're not, it's not me over you, and patriarchy will in fact be killed in this country and across the world eventually. And so I don't wanna die with it. <laughs> and as a man who believes in being a strong ally, I think that I should be present. Women hold the entire community on our backs. We carry everything with us. We don't just go to a struggle talking about our own issues and just talking about issues related to our makeup. We go into a room and we're concerned about our husbands, we're concerned about our brothers, our friends, our entire community. That's, that's the beauty of being a woman. And I often tell people that your feminism cannot possibly represent me if it does not include my 18-year-old son. That's right. This movement is about all of us working together. And I think that as men have had their time to lead, women will have our time to lead, and together we will make this world a better place. But if we are divided, there is no way that we will ever be able to get where it is that we need to go. So right now is the best time, because we're not really waiting for anyone to give us the baton. We're taking it, we're running with it, we're running for office, we're leading, we're leading, we're leading, and we will continue to lead. So your capacity for creating synergy across difference to make real change is inspirational, particularly at this time in our country when we seem unable to bridge our differences to engage in critical conversations. I know from reading your bio that your parents had a significant impact on you and your activism as, as it unfolded in a unique way for you. Hmm. So can you give us some sense of how your lived experience informs your current work in terms of how you create bridges across difference? I am uh, so incre incredibly inspired by the many groups who are coming together and working together who had never been talking in the past. You know, there are so many organizations and different sort of sectors of the movement, whether it be the immigrant community, working with the climate change community, the police brutality community, working with the economic um, empowerment community, folks just coming together because people are feeling the pressure all over. Mm -hmm. And it is good to see that, you know, what some may have meant for bad, others mean for good in terms of the work that is being done on the ground. And so that is incredibly uh, encouraging. At the same time, I think that we are in a very difficult space where people are certainly in their silos. You know, they want to ensure that their rights are protected. They want to ensure that uh, whatever pain they're feeling is addressed. And sometimes you have to be willing to put your own personal feelings aside and worry about the concerns of other communities, um, because I think that's how we make things happen in a holistic um, manner. And so for me, my parents were two of uh, Reverend Al Sharpton's first members. They helped start his organization a very, very long time ago, over 25 years ago. Yeah. And I had to go to rallies because they said so. It wasn't like a choice. Um, you know, it's like going to church. You, you will know, be an activist. Yeah, there's, there was, exactly. There was, it wasn't like, you know, on Sunday morning you get up and someone's saying, how do you feel? No, you were going. Mm -hmm. So I was a little girl going all over town, protesting, you know, and not understanding why I wanted to go skating and things like that. And they, they had something else in mind for me. Um, and I didn't really own the movement. It wasn't mine. It mm -hmm. was just like mommy and daddy's thing that I had to do. As I got older, you know, I began to get a little more aware of what was happening in society and that some things weren't fair, but it wasn't my issue. It didn't impact me because my parents also had me sheltered, my brothers and sisters. Hmm. We, we grew up, you know, in a very good situation. Um, and it wasn't until my son's father was murdered, when my son was just two years old, he's now 18, uh, so it's been 16 years, his father was shot and killed, um, and he was left in a ditch for nearly two weeks before his body was discovered. Uh, so by the time we saw him again after a trial, and we asked the DA to open up the records so that we could see his photos because one can imagine what it feels like for someone to tell you that your loved one is deceased and you never have an opportunity to see them. Um, so we always thought when, the, when someone knocked on the door that it could be him and maybe this was just a terrible joke that someone was playing on us. And so once we opened up the records, we saw that he was deceased, in fact. Um, and for me, the work that I had been engaged in was about caring about the victim and the shooter at the same time. 
And that was a very difficult space to try to own that once my son's father was murdered. The movement became my own at that moment because I realized that while I wanted to see that justice was done for my son's father, there were socioeconomic issues at play that made someone pick up a gun and shoot him in the first place. And that if I was going to be a real activist, if I was going to be really um, looked upon as a leader, I had to work just as hard on dealing with why a gun was in one person's hand mm -hmm. as much as I felt the, the need to deal with the idea that someone very close to me was killed. That, that takes an incredible level of yeah. compassion and really identifying with the other identifying with the other, putting down just my pain to deal with what was going on with another person, their family, where they came from, what their issues may have been. And, and, and let me just say, because I don't want people to look at me and say, oh, wow, how do you do that? It's not easy. There are days, um, and there had been days when I went to court and I didn't give a hoot about anything. I didn't care about their reason why. I just wanted my son's father to be here and the fact that he would never come back again made me angry. But you know, as I've begun to develop and I begin to understand more about what is happening in communities of color, what is happening with young black men, mm -hmm. I realized that there are, you know, there's more than one person that becomes the victim. There are two families and a community of people who are impacted by the loss of life of one. And while my son and, you know, certainly will never have his father. And as many people have, have come into his life, he's had such incredible leaders and male figures. He still yearns for his father. There are times mm -hmm. when I'm dealing with a kid that I'm thinking, what is wrong with you? And I will say to him, why are you fighting me? And I'll, you know, there have been moments when I say, you know, it is not my fault that your father is not here. And he will break down and start crying. And that's deep because he doesn't mean it. He doesn't know where it's coming from, but there is a lack in his life. There is something that's missing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been difficult to be concerned with the fact that there are, there's a person in prison for his death, for his father's murder, two people in prison for his father's murder, and their children also have no father. Um, so sometimes it's been difficult, but I've had to look at it from both sides in order to, to really be a real leader in this movement. Mm -hmm. We have a minute. <laughs> Give us a big idea in a minute. Whew, a big idea. No in pressure. A minute. Yeah. So I think that the big idea, rather than trying to introduce something different to this conversation, my big idea is around walking out of here, figuring out who have you not shown up for? Mm -hmm. You know, where have I not been? What community didn't mean as much to me? And Consider the idea that for us, people of color who come from marginalized communities, Donald Trump is not the beginning of our suffering. And if you realize that, if you put that little thing in your heart that says, this is not the beginning, I'm just joining in. And so I need to figure out how do I fight as hard as possible for people who I looked past before, mm -hmm. but today I realize that our pain is together and our liberation is going to be wrapped up in one another. Indeed. Thank you, Tamika. Thank you. Thank you.